Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm a research professor up there at the Geophysical Institute. And um, I've worked a lot. I've developed this project with, um, with Ben. Let me, let me see here. Let me change a couple settings here. There we go. And uh, yeah, Ben's helped a lot in developing this project. Um, we've, been, we've been at it for about three years and we published a paper last summer and I'll present some of the results from the paper. But then after that, I'll also talk about uh, these new projects and, and kind of where we're headed in the next few years. We have more uh, questions and answers, more hypotheses uh, at this stage than, than we do answers. Because as I say, a lot of these projects are just now getting after the off the ground after, after a few years. Um, I do also want to shout out to our collaborators, Ingmar Nietzsche and Guido Grossa at the Alfred Wegener Institute. And um, of course, there are other collaborators on the projects that are just now beginning. And um, we'll mention those a little bit, a little bit later on. Let's see. Just trying to advance the slide. There we go. So you may have seen um, just in the last few days, uh, National Geographic had a piece online and it's going to be in the September 2019 print version of the magazine. Uh, it's about terrestrial change, uh, a host of terrestrial changes in the Arctic, particularly permafrost degradation. And this is the background for this idealized graphic that they put together. And you guys will recognize a lot of the changes that they've represented here. Here's the thaw slump. It's a positioned a little bit strangely with regard to this little creek right here. But nonetheless, they got the thaw slump in here. They got the tundra fire. They got the retreating glacier. Um, you can see the degrading ice wedge polygons here and on the landscape. We see shrub expansion and uh, these boreal herbivores, these browsers who have wandered in the Arctic, we think, in the last century. Uh, moose and, and beavers made the diagram. So that was that was really exciting to see, and you can see little fish down here. So you guys are familiar with the range of changes, and uh, it was exciting to see uh, beavers get some, some face time in this uh, National Geographic. Like I say, it's online this week, and I think it comes out in print next month. And there's other parts of this idealized figure in the magazine and, and online. I think it's got carbon stores, because most, most of the articles fo focused on permafrost, but of course beavers are are part of that story. So that was fun. A quick outline. Uh, this is a picture just uh, several miles uh, west of Tulip, looking south at the Brooks Range. I'll talk about the recent changes in distribution of beavers, what we do know, what we don't know. And then I'll talk about some of these projects uh, we have forthcoming that are tracking all the impacts uh, of beavers in, in tundra ecosystems, or at least the initial stages. Like I say, this has taken about three years to get this research program off the ground. And this is probably what I'm going to be doing for the next five to 10 years. I'm super excited about it. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, this is the cartoon Ben was referring to. I just love this one. Uh, this is a, a local cartoonist from Fairbanks. His name's uh, Jamie Smith. And he actually drew this cartoon back in 2001, which it, it kind of makes them clairvoyant or, or something like that because, um, you know, this is really a, a pretty good representation of what's happening at treeline and in the tundra regions of Alaska right now. You know, beavers are looking out into a landscape that hasn't been re-engineered. It's free-flowing streams. It's free-flowing sloughs on floodplains, lake outlets that are open, and these beavers the thing is there's not one of them, there's thousands of them. There's a whole team of them right now that are you know, sort of at the edge of the tundra, part way into the tundra or all the way to the Bering Sea in certain cases uh, that are really poised to re-engineer the entire tundra landscape. And it's a question of how long is it gonna take them to, to get, you know, for example, to the, to the North Slope of Alaska or, uh, or across Northern Asia, but they do seem to be headed in that direction. And I think it's a pretty exciting time to be, to be studying this. Here's a figure pretty close to the one in our paper uh, last year. So the yellow, the orange line is tree line. So this is tree line in here. 
And that's historically been uh, the limit of, of beaver range, although we don't exactly know where it was, for example, before the fur trade began, you know, in the 1700s. But this is, a, we think of tree line as, as sort of the historic beaver range. Uh, there was one dam observed over here, uh, over by the McKinsey Delta, sort of making its way towards Alaska. Um, there's one dam on the Babbage River there. That was a paper in the Canadian Naturalist maybe three years ago. And then we had the realization that kind of kicked all this off, which is that, um, you know, I, I've been looking at herbivores moving into the tundra like moose uh, and snowshoe hare. And when the thought of beavers came up, it was particularly interesting because I, I realized that we might be able to track their movement into the tundra by looking at the formation and disappearance of beaver ponds from space. And that's pretty cool because not a lot of wildlife can you see their footprint uh, on the landscape from space. That's something generally reserved for humans. But in the case of beavers, uh, you can see the formation and disappearance of these ponds from space. And that's where Ben came in and really uh, had some amazing ideas. Of course, he and, and Ingmar Nietzsche and Guido Grosso over at the Alfred Wegener Institute, those guys have been tracking um, changes in Arctic, Arctic lakes uh, for over a decade. And so what Ben realized is that um, we could look for the formation and disappearance of beaver ponds in Landsat uh, imagery using wetting and drying trends. So you've got blanket coverage of, of the lands using the Landsat imagery and then you look at wetting and drying over the period 1999 to 2014 and if you see wetting or drying you drill down into that location uh, with the higher resolution imagery and then you can usually see pretty clearly in the imagery uh, whether or not that was due to uh, beavers building ponds or like I say beaver ponds drying. So we trialed that technique in this area here in northwestern Alaska and the yellow arrows indicate that these are observations of, of beavers colonizing that region. And uh, what I can tell you now too is that this entire area of the Seward Peninsula is absolutely loaded and, and way back here in the Selawik Lowlands is absolutely loaded with beaver dams um, a lot more than I think any any one of us realize certainly. It, the density varies from place to place, but uh, we'll get there in a little bit. It, it numbers in the thousands. So we'll drill down into this box right here just to show you uh, some results from this paper we had last year. Here's that box, this is that area. This is the Woolit Kivalina watershed. This is the lower no attack. And again, these are areas where we saw wetting or drying, almost always wetting, uh, using the, in the Landsat analysis and then uh, ben and I drilled down into these locations with the high-res imagery and um, identified 56 new beaver ponds. In fact, there's quite a few more than that, um, and we're sort of refining this technique uh, going forward. But this was the trial, and uh, yeah, 56 new beaver ponds in this area, and that was pretty exciting. This is, you know, there's a little bit of tree line right here in the lower no attack, but otherwise these are, this is all, pretty much all tundra. And so beavers are, are getting by without trees, which surprises a lot of people, um, but it, it's happening. And here's what it looks like when you drill down into the high-res imagery. Uh, 1952 to 1979, uh, nothing's really happening. Everything looks about the same. In 2005, it's really obvious. You've got a dam here and, and the beaver has arrived. Oops, sorry, go back up. By 2013, that initial pond is gone, but a new pond is, has formed down low. And you know, Ben and I, and probably others of you have spent a lot of time looking at time series imagery. You seldom, seldom do you see changes that are this dramatic. And so this is, you know, this is exciting. This was really exciting for us to see such dramatic changes on short time scales. And to show you what that looks in uh, with the Landsat data, this is what's called the tasseled cap wetness index. So this is wetter and drier on the y-axis, and here's time on the x-axis. And this, this triangle here is plotted down here. So this is, the, this is how wet it is. So you can see it's going along, it's going along, and then right in 2004, see we don't have an image from 2004, but what the Landsat is telling you is in 2004 is when that pond was constructed. And then that pond actually failed in 2006, and the beaver 
built uh, this lower pond in 2006 and actually maintained both ponds for several years. And then in 2010, this upper pond dried and, and all that's left is the lower pond. So you can see that how amazing that Landsat analysis is. It, it really can tell you the exact year uh, that dams are being built and dams are washing out. And so there's a lot of interesting questions you can also get at using that, that data. So that's kind of what this initial analysis looks like. Um, and we have a lot of hypotheses that stemmed from, from that research. That, that paper was loaded with hypotheses and sometimes I'm surprised that we were able to include those in, in the paper. Uh, but, it, but that's part of the exciting thing about it. So I'm going to talk about some of the starting projects and the hypotheses, and I'll have some more imagery further down that, that uh, describes some of the hypotheses that we're uh, working on testing over the next several years, several years going on 10 probably. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really at about stage three of 10. We, we've got a lot of funding in hand finally, but we haven't been out to the field uh, much at all. And uh, we still have a lot of analysis ahead of us. So the big NSF project that we got funded recently, and this is Ben and I, uh, is, is mapping, is taking that um, methodology that we developed that I just described and applying that all over the Arctic tundra of Alaska. And that's, and also looking, going back in time, using imagery, old imagery going back to the 50s to see how much has changed. Cause that's, that's really the perspective. I mean, I love little furry animals. That's, that's cool. That's, that's really interesting and exciting, but really we're, we're interested in the landscape change perspective on this. And so we're gonna look at how much beavers have dispersed, how much they've changed the landscape in the last uh, half century. So mapping is sort of the first major fundamental uh, thing that this project funds. And then, and then looking at impacts to physical attributes. So permafrost, water temperature, uh, stream ice thickness, uh, through field work and, and remote sensing. And I'll talk about some of the hypotheses in just a minute. And then looking at current and future habitat, dispersal rates, trying to figure out, well, right now there are no beavers on the North Slope of Alaska. And is it gonna be that way uh, forever? How long is it gonna be until the North Slope of Alaska looks like the Selawick Lowlands, which has well over a thousand beaver dam complexes? Um, I think is a really interesting question and we don't have an answer to it yet. And that, so that first project is, is essentially mapping and then looking at impacts to physical things, you know, water temperature, ice thickness, permafrost. And then um, we have another project here looking at uh, impacts to water quality, namely water chemistry, which I actually don't know all that much about, but then fish. And then this project includes some permafrost work as well, but fish is a huge deal uh, in Northern and Western Alaska. And, and really everywhere. Lots of work has been done on fish in um, more temperate ecosystems, you know, interactions between beavers and fish, but how this is gonna play out in a nutrient and temperature limited system with permafrost um, remains to be seen. There's, there's just no research has been done on it. And so usually I put up a blank slide that says impacts to fish. Um, but now we at least have a project that is, is, is addressing that. And then there's some other pending projects that, that I'm, that I'm working toward. One is a, a traditional eco ecological knowledge study. There's a lot of concern about this out in the villages. And um, so tapping into the traditional ecological knowledge about impacts to fish and, and water quality and access, you know, via boats and things like that. And then also beaver distribution in Northern Asia is a really huge, um, I think it's a really important question. They're, they're, they're a long ways behind us in Northern Asia. I, don't, I think the population just has not recovered from overtrapping um, because the vast majority of northern Asia is completely unoccupied by beavers and to me it looks like the habitat is there so that'll be another interesting uh, front. So a few pictures of these things. Uh, beaver ponds and tundra streams. This is a picture by a, a colleague of ours, uh, Chris Arp. And uh, so what this used to look like is just a little uh, sinuous single stream channel here that you see at the top and you see at the bottom and then beavers showed up and you can, these are what the dams look like in oblique, you know, oblique imagery. You can see all these dams, lots of dams. There's a lodge here, 
There's a lodge up here that's a little bit hard to see. And so, you know, they're creating these miniature wetlands that number in the thousands across Alaska right now. And to me, it, a lot of it is just a question of what density do they end up, um, you know, colonizing these regions. They have a huge impact. You know, when you pool water in the landscape, as you guys know, because you're permafrost scientists, um, you absorb a lot more energy. You start to thaw permafrost laterally and vertically underneath these ponds. And um, so anyway, they have huge impacts. Uh, here's an example of one from the Seward Peninsula. This one's only about, I think this is probably 30 miles from Shishmaref. So they're all the way to the, to the Bering Sea uh, in Western Alaska. This is what it looks like in satellite imagery. So this is another one on the Seward Peninsula. This is over sort of in the Nome area. So you start out with a little small stream and this is what this stream looks, looked like, just what it looks like up in the top and the bottom here until beavers showed up um, in the last 30 years. And here, there's a dam here, there, there's a dam here, there's a lodge in here. This is a dam right here. This is a dam through here, here's a lodge. More, there's another dam here, there's another dam here, there's a lodge here. Note, this is Nome Dam 176. This, this only gets one pin. So I call these dam complexes. You know, in other words, I don't mark every little dam here, but the, the point is that when I start talking about thousands of dam complexes, each one of those complexes is somewhere between one and 10 different beaver dams. So it's a little, you know, miniature wetland. So that's uh, an example of what beavers do to these little streams. Here's another pretty much random example. This is Selowick Dam Complex number 862. Um, and uh, so this river's flowing right to left. Uh, I might, there might be something blocking it right now, but there's a dam down here. There's dams in here. This was actually supposed to be a, a dam on a slough, but in this case, the beaver went ahead and, and dammed the whole river. But uh, there's a whole series of dams in here that has, um, you know, created a wetland where before you had single, maybe a dual channel floodplain, and uh, instead you have a wetland. And you can imagine that has all kinds of implications, you know, off channel habitat for fish, uh, pooling deeper water, uh, again, absorbing more energy uh, than the, the tundra landscape that, that preceded it. And so here's what it looks like in a little bit of the time series, and I'll, I'll introduce a few of the hypotheses that we have. Um, so inundation of valley bottoms, we know that from other ecosystems, that's just what beavers do, at least the ones that aren't, you know, building bank dens or living in a lodge on a lake. You know, these are actual, we can't see beavers in bank dens, and, and that's fine. We're really interested in the beavers that are engineering the landscape and, and changing the hydrology. And so here's an example that, that Ben put together, uh, 1951, there's no beaver here. 2005, the beaver arrives. It, raised, it dams the lake, uh, lake outlet, which is also a little stream, floods this area, and this is uh, about 100 meters by 500, so about 500 square meters of collapse uh, ground here of thermal karst at the edge of this lake. It actually dams the stream and changes the channel, so the stream used to go this way, the beaver dams it, and the stream just starts making a new channel over here. And in the process, you can see all this uh, thawing polygonal ground. And by 2016, the stream has actually changed, changed channels. Uh, and it looks like the beaver might actually be gone by, by this point. But you can see all, all the thermocarst here. So changes in hydrology lead to permafrost thaw. I don't need to tell you guys that. That's probably the biggest impact that, that we see beavers as having is, is um, thawing permafrost and creating essentially heat oases. Um, and, so, and, and so not only are they changing hydrology, but they're ponding, they're making the water deeper in these creeks, they're creating ponds, which means warmer water in, in winter, and that's how you get the, the vertical thaw, uh, as well as the lateral thaw, like you see in this example above. And of course, these have biological consequences as well. I mean, this is going to be increased aquatic habitat during the winter. So I kind of think of them as, as little oases. And, and, you know, that warm water leaks out 
downstream uh, it allows you know fish eggs to incubate where before the water was too cold and um, so yeah the best analog that I have for, for beavers is, is like dotting these waterways with hundreds thousands of groundwater springs because you're adding these sort of heat islands and this disturbance right it's an entirely new disturbance regime you know the best analog for beavers is people the second best analog for, for beavers is probably wildfire because, you know, fires in the tundra, the, the footprint is completely different, but the point is you've got, it's like hitting the system over the head with a hammer. Um, and, and here, if beavers are successful, they're going to dot all of the Arctic tundra with these, these oases. So here you have um, 1950 to 1985, nothing's changed at all. Um, that, that's, you know, we're used to looking at time series imagery like this, but there's not much change. And then 85 to 2002, the beaver gets in there, builds some dams, and suddenly you've got thermokarst in this pond here. And the beaver gets into the stream and builds a series of dams uh, down here. And, and again, a lot more uh, flooding of the landscape creates a miniature wetland. And of course, all the thermokarst uh, continues. So I think about what we would expect. And I've seen now hundreds of examples of this. Uh, one more part of the hypothesis, just to mention it, we're almost at the end here. Uh, we've got two streams coming together. This is stream B and stream A. There's a confluence here and the beaver builds a dam here and diverts the water and then builds a series of uh, tiered dams here. And so what you see in the winter of 2010, and, and this is N equals one, this is one of the things we want to test in our field work, but you see the open water downstream of the dam. And uh, we think, and, and we're, we hypothesize that, that this is due to these dams um, having deeper water and warmer water that then leaks out during the winter. And that's the kind of um, new aquatic habitat that uh, will probably, and this is part of the oasis too, right? It's an aquatic oasis as well, where you have warm water just like at a groundwater spring, you're gonna have a groundwater spring in the tundra. You, know, you see species that you don't otherwise see in the tundra. And we think the same type of pattern might, might be occurring with these beaver dams. So those give you an idea sort of where we're headed in some of the um, hypotheses that we're trying to test, what we do and do not know. And, um, and then, you know, finally, I haven't said anything about, you know, the increasing beaver habitat in the Arctic. You guys are all familiar with it. Uh, shrub expansion means more food. Shorter winters means, you know, less time to survive on their cached food over winter, right? These guys don't hibernate. They're living in their lodge over winter and their, their feet are not adapted to snow. So they really have to wait for spring to come before they come out of their lodge. So they got shorter winters, you got more unfrozen water, in winter and you've got more food so it, it looks to us like there's just a lot more beaver habitat in the tundra than there used to be at the same time um, they are recovering or at least have been recovering from from over trapping alaska during the uh, 19th and early 20th century so it's some combination of these factors and it's not clear to me exactly how we're going to get at this question but i do think we're going to be able to get at it when we look at some of the habitat constraints uh, from the places they're living now. I think that's my last slide. I do want to mention, I guess I sort of mentioned it already, but you know, right now that what we know now that we didn't know last year is that the number of beaver dam complexes in the Alaska tundra, which only is the Seward Peninsula, the Selawik Lowlands, and that sort of part of the Western Brooks Range, so it's not the North Slope, numbers around between two and 3,000 dam complexes, probably closer to 3,000 of these dam complexes. So um, that's where we're at right now. And uh, I'd be definitely curious to hear uh, your guys' questions and, uh, and thanks for your attention. Excellent, excellent presentation, Ken. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Um, nice, nice timing too. So we have roughly um, 10 minutes or so for questions here following Ken's presentation. Does anybody on the line have any, any questions for Ken? I do, yes. This is really cool and interesting. Thank you. Um, so I don't quite know. What do they build their 
dams with. I thought like sticks from trees, and so I can imagine that shrubs will work, but how about grassland tundra? Like, what would they do then? Yeah, it's a great question, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna give you a, a speculative answer. Yeah. Uh, I, I get that question a lot, and I need to be able to answer it more concretely. <laughs> which unfortunately is going to involve like taking some dams apart, uh, which sounds like a lot of work, but uh, shrubs and mud. And, and I think, I think grass too, because, you know, one of my neighbors in Fairbanks said that, you know, out on the YK Delta, they, they, they basically just build it out of grass and, and mud. Uh, I don't know how that would work, but most of the ones that I'm looking at, I think are a combination of, of shrubs and, and mud and moss. But that that's kind of that's kind of just a guess. So it's a great question. Hi, it's Peter Griffith. Um, hey, Peter. It's a great presentation. Uh, very nicely done. Um, I'm uh, I'm uh, curious about um, the potential carbon flux uh, implications. Uh, it seems like uh, there's. Um, you know, there, there's uh, going to be, you know, whatever uptake from uh, shrubification, uh, but the potential release of a lot of methane from all of those um, brand new ponds that they're forming. Yeah, certainly, you know, uh, initially it looks like a lot of um, methane loss just due to the initial thawing permafrost. And and probably that maintains to a, to a net loss even over the long term. But, but I don't really know, you know, once that wetland is established, you know, how those fluxes would, would change in the longer term. Um, you know, Katie Walter, Anthony, and I wrote a proposal a couple of years ago to try to fund some methane work that, that, that didn't get funded. But uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to be revisiting that because it's, it's, that's one of the most important important implications of this work. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ben? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think you guys should revisit submitting that proposal now that you have um, kind of like laid the groundwork that this um, activity of beavers moving into the tundra is going on. Um, you're showing impacts to hydrology and permafrost. And so I think that'd be a nice next step is actually getting some funding to address that question. And I guess I could follow up real quick on Peter. So do you have any idea of, say, um, ancient beaver presence in the Arctic tundra, say, for example, uh, during the Holocene thermal maximum? Or is there evidence of, of beaver activity in, on the north slope of Alaska or on the Seward Peninsula of Alaska? I don't think that's a question for me. Who did you mean to address that to? That's to, that's to Ken, following on your, your Oh, point. I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, so that's another project that we're, <laughs> we're working on because, I mean, it's, it's a great question. So I, I think there's, you can look at archaeological sites and there isn't much, but I've looked at a decent number of archaeological sites in the last year and it turns out archaeologists don't really care about fauna most of the time. They don't care about animals. You know, they're always looking for humans and so the animal remains at these archeological sites tend to be fairly poorly documented. And so even though there's archeological sites all across the map, you know, you, you but I tell you what though, you go to Cape Cruz and turn right, which is in the area of Northwestern Alaska where we documented the 56 beaver ponds uh, for that paper last year. And Cape Cruz and Stern has like 7,000 animal bones that have all been identified and zero are beavers. And there are beavers behind Cape Cruisenstern right now, you know, ones that have just moved in there in the last 30 years. So, you know, there's, there's pretty good evidence that, that they weren't there before, but, you know, as the saying goes in archeology, span uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And so I think really what you were suggesting, Ben, which was the eDNA probably holds the most hope for answering that question. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really important one. You know, what is the precedent for the current condition? Nice. Yeah, that's pretty darn interesting. 7,000 bones and no, you know, no identified beaver bones in the archaeological record out there. Yeah, that's pretty compelling. Same with like Matarak Lake and the central no attack. 
there it's, it's even more, it's tens of thousands of bones. And I don't think there are beaver bones there at all. So, but the number of sites that have that good faunal remains are like four in the tundra, you know, so it's you a little briefly, tricky. You briefly mentioned TDK and um, maybe I missed if you followed up, if you've been able to work with any traditional knowledge holders uh, to uh, say what uh, the elders and the great, great elders uh, used to talk about in terms of beaver. Yeah, so I've got a pending project with uh, Department, Alaska Department of Fish and Game looking at that question. Um, but I don't know right now. I mean, I've heard, there's anecdotal stuff I've heard, you know, um, that that beavers are new to these areas from, for example, uh, in Shishmaref. You know, people were asking the National Park Service, well, how are you supposed to carve up and, and use, put a beaver to use? You know, how are you supposed to, can you eat the meat and stuff like that? But that, that's just anecdotal at this point, so I don't want to speak for a whole culture. Can I ask another question or is someone else having an urgent question first? Well, I have a comment about um, the early Holocene. Um, I have vague recollections. It's been a while since I read the paper, but Dan Mann and maybe uh, Mary Edwards having some papers that discussed um, the populace expansion on the North Slope. Um, and I thought there was evidence for beavers, perhaps, but it might be a place to look, or maybe you have already and I'm wrong, but, um, but another thing to look at maybe is actually if there's gnawed wood, for example. Um, anyway, just a thought. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like you and I need to write a proposal to uh, float some rivers up there and, and find <laughs> some gnawed wood. Yes, you're right, yeah. gnawed wood. Eating gnawed wood is probably the, um, the the best evidence, you know, that that you can find. Uh, dating gnawed wood or or finding bones, but finding bones is you know practically impossible unless you're damn man. Um, but yeah, I, I know. I know uh, like Ben Gagliotti told me, you know, Ben Ben Gagliotti's work with Dan Man, and he told me that he would found paleo beaver chewed wood on the North Slope. I think once you get, like there's a paper by um, uh, David Hopkins and a guy named I think David McCullough and, and David Hopkins uh, from an area on the Seward Peninsula where they had uh, old beaver knot wood from, you know, 5,000 years ago. So they, they've been in the tundra before, um, but I guess I'm wondering how recently, really what I would like to know is where were beavers before the fur trade started? You know, before people started trapping them heavily, how far into the tundra were they? Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right that, that, that finding beaver gnawed wood is, is kind of the best evidence and, and maybe some of that eDNA stuff, but it, it, it's, it gets to be so far beyond what I normally do <laughs> in science that I have a hard time assessing some of those ideas, but uh, yeah, looking for beaver nod wood sounds like fun. And I have another question. What, what do you think is motivating them to move into the tundra areas? Is it, are they looking for food? Is it that shrubs are expanding and they're able to build houses there? What's the... Impetus? That's a great question. Um, I think what I've heard is that beavers have a strong dispersal tendency so, you know, the young get kicked out of the house after, I think, a year. Maybe it's two years, one or two years, I can't remember. But so, so they got to go find a new place to live uh, pretty quickly. And, you know, I think if the habitat, if you swim downstream and you find, you know, good habitat, because uh, like a lot of these areas, like the Celebic Lowlands, I mean, it looks like carrying capacity to me. I mean, I've, like I say, I've found uh, a thousand beaver dams and I've only searched half of that area. 
uh, where the high resolution imagery is available. And uh, so th they're everywhere. So if you're a young beaver and you're kind of like, hey, where am I supposed to put up my house? You know, I think being able to go to an area that uh, hasn't had beavers before might, might pose some advantages. I think the only thing right now that's keeping them and crossing the Brooks range is tough for a beaver. You know, the, the, the habitat isn't that great up in those passes. And so it'll be interesting once they drop into some of those north flowing rivers and, and some swim downstream, it'll be interesting how fast they get a foothold. Cause I've actually had raft guides up there looking for beaver knob wood and they have found it. They found some pieces of beaver knob wood on the Atibla, uh, which flows into the Colville, you know, and there's, there's habitat down there. So I think that's the, the exciting thing is, is going to be just watching them over the span of our careers and seeing if they continue to, you know, push, push these frontiers into the, onto the North slope. My question would relate to this. Why would they move away from an area that they have colonized? You showed in quite a few photos that they left the area. And I'm curious, why would they do that? These are great questions. And I don't, I'm just guessing at the answers. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, I'll take a guess. I mean, well, one thing, if your dam gets washed out, well, you, you can't live with mom and dad forever, right? So they have to, you know, after one or two years, they, they have to leave. But why would like a mature beaver, you know, leave an area that they'd already developed? I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think they would. I think they would stay there. And I mean, some of these beaver dams, I just picked a few examples from you guys, but they're like major homestead complexes. I mean, you really develop a lot of respect for these creatures because they built up these incredible and there's probably there's multiple families living there and, and whatnot but yeah why, why does the beaver go to a new place maybe it maybe it gets washed out by a big flood you know do you rebuild in the same place if you get washed out by a big flood or do you decide eh, maybe that wasn't a very good place i'm gonna look elsewhere but i'm, I'm just guessing so hmm Good questions, guys. I, I, I love talking about this, so. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, great presentation too, Ken. And um, thanks, thanks. Everybody for the questions. We, um, we had one in the chat box from Helene. Um, she says, awesome presentation, Ken, with an exclamation point. Thanks, Helene. <laughs> um, so I think we have, let's see, four, three to four minutes left um, for this month's webinar. So anybody have any final um, discussion points or comments for Ken and or just for the general um, permafrost collaboration team community? Um, I guess no in that regard. So looking forward, we have um, tentative plans for September um, PCT webinar and more firm plans for the October one. So. Um, looking up to October 8th, we will be doing our PCT webinar on the IPCC special report. Um, Christina, do we have a speaker in mind for that presentation? Yeah, there will be Ted Shore. Okay, cool. Yeah, which would be awesome. So yeah, Ted will give us an overview of the, um, the uh, upcoming IPCC special report, which is, I believe, slated to come out at the end of September, correct? Yep. Okay, cool. And then in September, um, we're still working on the plans for next month's webinar, um, but I think I will probably join, um, join in, in the discussion with uh, Claire Hemingway at the National Science Foundation. Uh, Claire is a program manager for the ExcelNet program, which is a program focused on developing international networks of networks. Um, a, a fairly sizable group of us, uh, I think it was like 71 in the end, submitted a proposal to the ExcelNet solicitation back in the spring that was recently recommended for funding. Um, so we'll talk about, the idea would be for Claire to kick off the meeting for about 20 minutes, give an overview of, of the ExcelNet program at, at NSF, and then I would take over for the next maybe 10 to 15 minutes and talk about our recommended permafrost coastal systems network. Um, that basically brings together 
uh, colleagues from around 16 different countries um, focused on the impacts uh, and changes occurring along uh, permafrost coastlines, uh, low-lying permafrost areas, and how those changes are impacting uh, permafrost, ecosystems, infrastructure, and society. Um, so we're thinking about, I believe it's the 16th of September, but we'll, yeah, we'll work on that more over the coming weeks and then send out a notice probably within a week or two. Um, so I guess that's a, that's a wrap for the August PCT meeting. Thanks, Ken. That was a great presentation. Um, Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, it's nice to, to see the connection between, um, yeah, permafrost, ecosystems, hydrology. It's, it's a really interesting project that you have, have going on. Look forward to maybe you giving another presentation in a year from now or something like that. Cool. Um, anybody else, any final comments before we hit the, hit the hang up button? Okay, good. Are we good to go, Meredith? Yeah, thanks everyone. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Talk to you next month. Thank you. See you guys.